Crimson Trace announces Link, the world's first wireless laser and white light system, combining a green laser and 300 lumen light with instinctive activation for AR-type rifles. Link, smart, simple, secure. Learn more at crimsontrace.com. This is Tom Gresham's Gun Talk, now available on iTunes and other podcast clients and on the free Gun Dealio smartphone app for iPhone and Android. Feel free to call Tom now at 1-TOM-TALK-GUN or 866-825-5486 or email Tom at GunTalk.com. Now, once again, here's Tom. All right, back with you. I'm Tom Gresham. It is Gun Talk. Glad that you could be with us. If you'd like to join us, well, that's easy. 866-TALK-GUN gets you in here. Or just dial Tom Talk Gun. Tom, that's me. And what do we do here? We talk guns. So Tom Talk Gun. That'll certainly get you in here. Hey, we're giving away stuff, as we like to do. If you go to our website, guntalk.com, and hit the win button or guntalk.com slash win, you can find our giveaway, this month's giveaway, Let's see, we're doing a September starter pack giveaway. A, one person is going to win $1,000 in SIG handgun ammo. Somebody else is going to win two SIG electro optics. Uh, somebody's going to win a SIG P210 target pistol. Holy cow, that's a great pistol. Uh, somebody's going to get the uh, SIG MCX air rifle with a red dot plus everything that goes with it. Uh, four people are going to get a $50 gift card to use at crossbreedholsters.com. A uh, whole bunch of cool stuff going on. Starter pack if uh, from the grand prize is a concealed carry starter pack from Cross Street Holsters and some other folks. Uh, go to guntalk.com slash win. Now, you know that uh, I'm kind of loopy for revolvers. I started with revolvers when I was real little. Uh, I remember shooting when it first came out, the model 57 Smith uh, 41 Magnum. Put a scope on it. I think I was 15, drove out to the range. Uh, like second or third shot, scope goes flying past my ear, <laughs> came off the gun. They didn't have any mounts back then, good enough for that. Uh, but I've always liked revolvers. And so it was uh, a lot of fun when I discovered there's somebody else who likes them, maybe as much, maybe even more than I do. So I'm going to welcome him right now. Justin Carroll has a website called revolverguy.com. Justin, welcome. Tom, thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. So, Okay. Uh, your background is not exactly revolver world. Uh, military? Yes, sir. Uh, special operations community, uh, about a dozen years in that as, as a military guy and then a civilian with some other government organizations. And, uh, and now I'm just a, a, a regular civilian. Okay, so special ops guys, in fact, nobody in the military that I'm aware of uses revolvers much. I mean, it may be a really, really rare esoteric thing. So how do you go from the Berettas and the SIGs and things like that to a revolver? Uh, so I carried 1911s and Glocks for most of my time in the military, some experience okay. on the Beretta. And after I got out, um, I just kind of hit this point where I realized if I had to pick up a revolver, I wouldn't know. I'd probably get six shots off, and that's about it, maybe. Uh, so it was something I wanted to learn to have a more well-rounded mastery of firearms generally. Mm -hmm. uh, and I travel incessantly for work. It's not uncommon to have 150, 200 nights here in hotels. Mm -hmm. And I needed something that is as legal as it can possibly be everywhere I go. So mm -hmm. that kind of drove me in that direction. Oh, okay. So you don't have to worry about magazine capacity limits and that type of thing. Yeah, I didn't want to have to worry about when I left for a trip and might have to go somewhere else. Do I take my 10-rounders and leave my 15-rounders mm -hmm. or, or how, to, how to juggle that? Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So tell me about this journey you went on then to discover revolvers. So I, I discovered Chris Baker's Wheel Gun Wednesday on the Lucky Gunner Lounge. And he had, uh, he was kind of going through the same journey that I was thinking about embarking upon. So uh, I, I had an old Smith & Wesson 686 that I picked up a few years earlier and I wanted something that I could carry, so kind of on his advice, I bought a Smith & Wesson 640 Pro Series, mm -hmm. and that's what I've carried on a daily basis for about the last two years. And uh, now I I'm, I'm, uh, consider myself quite a bit more confident and capable with, with wheel guns than I was when I started. 
Well, you may not know, but uh, at the first of the year, I declared that 2017 is the year of the revolver. And it, I just made that up completely. But I was watching <laughs> all of these introductions from manufacturers. And, and I, you know, they probably were sitting on some of these for a while. They could just crank out things. They didn't have to turn out new product. They just kept making things because the demand was there. But then the demand slowed down. They said, well, let's bring out some new things. So, you know, we have things like uh, revolvers in 327 Federal. We have, uh, you know, five, six, and seven shot revolvers. We, you know, uh, Kimber brings out a revolver. We've got, you know, obviously Smith and Ruger cranking out stuff. We've got the little uh, smaller 44 Special revolver from Ruger. It just goes on and on. Um, what do you think? Is that, it, it kind of is the year of the revolver, isn't it? I could not disagree with you, uh, but I hope next year is even bigger for revolvers. <laughs> I, I hope this trend kind of keeps going. Uh, I, I guess kind of selfishly because I absolutely love revolvers and all these new products. Kimber just released some new versions of the K6, the Cobra. Mm-hmm. I'm excited to see these new guns coming out. That's right. Col- Cobra is out. So, okay, you got this website called revolverguy.com. What do you do there? What, what are people going to find when they go there? So you'll find uh, uh, not a lot of gun reviews yet. I just got my first T&E gun from Ruger a couple of weeks ago, so I, I'm working on that. Uh, I find a ton of reviews of speed loaders. That's uh, one of the first things I started to focus on with revolvers is there's 50 different speed loaders on the market. Which one's the best? Which one do I use? Why don't they all work with all guns and that sort of stuff? Uh, you'll find a little bit of uh, – you know, product reviews and some, some tactical stuff, as well as some really good articles by Mike Wood, who wrote uh, The New Hall Shooting, a tactical analysis, and right. who I believe you've had on this show. Yes, uh, So he and I are, are kind of working hand-in-hand hand on that, and it's a, it, it's a growing project and consuming more and more of my time. And uh, fortunately for me, it's something I really enjoy spending my time on. So uh, ha- check it out. Will do. Okay, revolverguy.com. Now, uh, as I'm sitting here, let me just double check. Okay, yep, we're unloaded. Okay. All right. Uh, Smith uh, 686, seven shot, three inch barrel, the deluxe uh, plus version in a uh, leather holster because I believe they should be in leather holsters. Something about revolvers. I saw you just did something on leather holsters uh, on your website, too. Uh, <laughs> it is amazing how many different holster makers are out there. And, you know, yeah, we know about our the big holster makers. Everybody knows about those. But there are a lot of smaller shops making some really fine leather goods that really work well for revolvers. Absolutely, there are. Um, I Actually, um, Mike Wood is working on an article about El Paso Saddlery's Jordan rig. Um, mm-hmm. The big ones, Galco, DeSantis, uh, as well as a, a ton of smaller ones. And i got to be honest with you, Tom, for, for daily carry, I'm a Kydex guy. I, I, it, it's hard for me to get away from that. So I, I'm actually carrying a, an AIWB from Dark Star Gear. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not paid to advertise by them. And, and my first review of this holster honestly wasn't all that flattering, but I've kind of come to love it. So hmm. a ton of options out there. But uh, aftermarket support is, is one of those things that I would like to see catch up to the revolvers because it's still – you don't have the options you have if you're going to carry a Glock 43 or a MP Shield or something right. along those lines. Right. Uh, I've been experimenting, and I've been able to conceal kit 686, 3-inch barrel, 7-shot, 357, outside the waistband holster using a uh, Lobo gun leather uh, holster. And with an untucked shirt, untucked shirt, it works perfectly. And it is super comfortable. So just I kind of throw that out. Don't forget the the Lobo guys. They make really nice leather holsters. But, you know, I'm going way back to, obviously, Smith's had its J-frame forever. But when Ruger brought out the LCR, that light compact uh, revolver of theirs, and had a different trigger mechanism, which didn't stack so that people could actually, uh, a lot of people had maybe hands that were not as strong and they could fire at double action, I think that was a, a demarcation point also. I absolutely agree. And uh, as far as the LCR goes, I, I think it's as ugly as a pair of homemade shoes, but, man, that gun shoots, and it, it carries super, super well. Um, 
personally for a primary carry gun, I like something, uh, you know, all steel guns. I, I do carry a J-frame on a daily basis. Yeah, wait, 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 like, wait, wait. This is, this is from the guy who carried a Glock for so long, right? <laughs> The, the, one it's of the true, ugliest things true. ever created, and you know, so, you, so, but you like steel, but but you carry a Glock, so we call it. We're going to color you confused. How's that? <laughs> no, that's that's fair. That's totally fair. Yeah, I don't know something about revolvers. I like steel. I like leather. I like, uh, I you know, I like pre lock Smith and yep. Wessons. Uh, yep. it, yeah, just just can't help myself. No, I, I, like I, I understand. <laughs> now, one of the things I'm, I haven't looked a whole lot now, are you also uh, got to cover or doing things on single action revolvers? Uh, that is definitely not off the table. I am not the man. If, if someone wants to write something about single action revolvers and send it to me, uh, <laughs> I, I need a single action guy because that is, that is not me. I, I may uh-huh. pick that up at some point, but I'm still learning – Every article I write, it feels like I learned something about revolvers, about their history, their maintenance, or uh, about how to employ them. So uh, I'm still trying to fully get my arms around the double action revolver, but I'd love to pick up the single action uh, eventually. Okay, well, if somebody is a single action uh, person, man or woman, and they want to write about it, they can go to your website, revolverguy.com. And uh, maybe you guys can make contact. I, Justin, thank you so much. I love uh, hearing your enthusiasm for the revolver. I share it with you. And as you uh, go further and further, there's just so much to explore and to learn. Awesome, Tom. Thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. You take care. Yeah, we call it the, the year of the revolver. There's so, I'm not sure what it is, but there's something about revolvers or something primal or elemental or being able to see that cylinder turn. Do you like revolvers? Have you ever carried a revolver? What is it for you? For you, what is it about revolvers that's just so much fun? 866-TALK-GUN. When someone leaves you their gun collection, you may want a few, but what do you do with the rest? How do you sell them? Who do you call? Well, I call Johnny Dury at Dury's Guns. Whether you're selling one gun or 500, they'll tell you what it's worth and write you a check. Simple, quick, easy, fair. I trust Dury's Guns. Give them a call. Dury'sGuns.com. Hi, this is Tom Gresham from Gun Talk. America is losing critical wildlife habitat at a rate of one football field every hour. It's happening on the Louisiana coast, but it's critical to all sportsmen and conservationists. These precious wetlands provide winter habitat for more than 10 million ducks and geese annually, waterfowl that migrate north through dozens of states. Don't shrug it off. Get involved. You can help. Visit vanishingparadise.org. It's really pretty simple. Your carry gun is a life-saving device. It must be with you. That's what the Springfield Armory XDS is all about. Small enough to carry, big enough to shoot comfortably, shockingly slim, single stack, with a 3.3-inch or 4-inch barrel, available in 9, 40, or 45. Highly accurate, great trigger, fiber optic front sight for fast aimed fire. The XDS at Springfield-Armory.com. That's Springfield-Armory.com. Attacks happen every day. How will you react? See real people put into real-life criminal attack situations on First Person Defender. Discover what works and what doesn't. Kidnapping, ATM robbery, home invasion, and other attacks. Learn how to save your life and the lives of your family. Get the entire first season on DVD at ShopGunTalk.com. Get prepared. ShopGunTalk.com. Are you looking for a place to shoot? The National Shooting Sports Foundation has a great website called wheretoshoot.org. It's the largest database of shooting ranges on the Internet. It's also a great resource for shooters where you can find video tips, printable targets, and a lot more. Find it online at wheretoshoot.org. And while you're there, download their free iPhone app. That's wheretoshoot.org. Black Hills, there's nothing like it on Earth. 
The kind of place where characters become legends. Wild Bill Hickok. Crazy Horse. Calamity Jane. Pick any part of the world and you'll find people go there to make it their own. But this is where people come to get made. This is the place that made the people who make the best ammo on earth. Black Hills Ammunition. Michael sends me a note, uh, says, get ready. Hollywood has an anti-gun movie coming out next week. Sure that all the stars will be making the circuit on TV and radio. It's called Shot. Tells a tragic story, of course. It'll go nowhere. They'll lose money on it. It's another preachy, lousy movie, I'm sure. Of Guns are bad. Guns cause turmoil. If you have a gun, it's not only going to affect you, but everybody around you, probably everybody in your neighborhood, and possibly everybody in your city, and maybe even most of the people in your state, because you had a gun. Yeah, give me a break. Uh, They try this stuff every now and then, try to trot it out. Uh, Typically goes nowhere. Even the the biggest one, and and one would argue the most successful one, would be the American president. Uh, And even that was so preachy as to be ignorable. So, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, I want to go to line one. Kathy uh, is with us now, and she uh, actually sent me a fascinating email. I said, we got to get you on the show. Kathy, are you there? Yes, sir. All right. So tell me what happened to you. This is a fascinating story. Well, I was leaving the subdivision last Sunday night, and the neighbor stopped me. And we had a conversation for a couple hours. And a great deal of that was about people being shot by police officers for miscommunication. So we had a lot of discussion on what's recommended, what we do, what we should do, that kind of stuff. When you say miscommunication, you mean like somebody who has a carry permit and maybe the cop sees a gun or sees them reaching and he ends up getting, you know, shooting somebody? Yes, sir. Okay. So not five minutes later, I made a lane change in front of a police car. Mm-hmm. Now it's dark out, <laughs> and then the lights came on his car, and then it was like probably about a quarter of a mile from a McDonald's well-lit parking lot. So I pulled in there, rolled down my windows, had my driver's license on the dash, and had my hands at 10 and 2. So a young officer approached, and he stood straight out from the back of my seat, and asked for my driver's license and registration. Mm -hmm. So I handed him my driver's license, and I paused. And he reminded me he wanted my registration. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, there's the problem, because I'm not comfortable getting that for you, because it's located in the glove box under my elbow, underneath the handgun. And he said, that's okay. Go ahead and get the registration. And I thought, well, I don't think he understood what I'm saying because he can't even see the registration or the glove box. Mm -hmm. And about a year ago, I'd been stopped. I did not have a handgun in there. But when I told the officer that where my registration was located and I knew he couldn't see me get into it, Mm -hmm. he said, that's okay. I don't need it. So this guy may know different reaction. He didn't move. He didn't say anything other than, yeah, go ahead. So I just, I didn't feel comfortable. So I repeated myself and said, I'm sorry, but I do not feel comfortable getting the registration for you because my handgun's on top of it. So he asked me, he says, well, where is your registration? And where is the handgun? I said, they are located under my elbow in the glove box between the seats. He says, well, go ahead and get it. And he still didn't do anything different. Hmm. And, I, and, and I started to get nervous. And I said, I'm really sorry. I do not feel comfortable doing this. And he, he asked me again where it was, and I told him. And then it was like he had a light bulb moment. And he walked forward to the front fender of my car so he could look through the dashboard. And he put his hand on his gun. Strange as it seems, now I felt safe. Wow, that's weird. 
Well, I knew he understood what I was saying at that point. Okay. So I don't know if earlier he thought, oh, it's just an older lady, no big deal, or he just wasn't registering. I couldn't tell. Mm -hmm. But once he had his hand on his gun and stood where he could watch me open that box and get in there, then I knew he understood that there's a gun in there. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, a Kimber Micro in a leather holster. And it's right on top. So the first thing I did is I picked it up with two fingers and laid it on the dash. Hmm. And then I got the registration. And then he took his hand off the gun. He came back to the window. I handed him the registration. Well, first I was looking. I had like three or four papers I was looking through. Right. Well, while I was doing that, he says, since we are parked here for a while, I'm going to do this. And he reached inside, picked up the gun, removed it from the holster, removed the magazine, and cleared the barrel. Then he laid the gun back down, and he kept the magazine. And he said, when we're done here, if I don't give you back your magazine, remind me to give it to you. Hmm. I said, okay. okay. So I gave him the registration. He went back to his car. And probably three minutes later, he came back and handed me back my license and registration. He says, well, I tell you what, I'll only give you a warning because I really appreciate the way you handled the handgun and explaining it to me. Hmm. He says, I wish everybody carried a handgun. He says, I don't go anywhere without a handgun. And some of my fellow officers don't think everyone should carry a gun. But I do, wow. and I appreciate that you do. Well, Kathy, thank you for sharing that with us. It's uh, quite the uh, encounter, and you had presence of mind because you had just walked through it in your head. You've been there mentally. That is terrific. Uh, and thank you for sending me that note. Thank you for, for being who you are. For those who don't know, Kathy sometimes uh, joins us on the show, and uh, uh, NRA life member, life member of staff, uh, on and on and on. Kathy is a gun girl for sure. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That is fascinating. Uh, wow. Story of a uh, traffic stop. Yeah, it sounds like maybe the officer just wasn't registering, wasn't listening. He was going through the motions. He kind of had his uh, idea of what he was going to encounter, and that wasn't it. 866-TALK-GUN. Have you ever had a traffic stop of you were carrying? How'd it go? Gun Talk encourages you to support the local sporting goods store, gun stores, ATV dealers, and other local businesses in your area who advertise on this station and Gun Talk. Only together can we protect our rights. You're listening to Washington Times Opinion Page regular contributor, Tom Gresham. All right, back with the 866 Talk Gun, taking your calls, uh, range reports. Anything like that? Anything you're, basically, it's open lines. Anything you want to talk about, if it's about guns, we'll talk about it. I see that, uh, let's see, the National Shooting Sports Foundation put out a release last week talking about flooded guns. Also, the NSSF and SAMI, uh, they argued to the California Supreme Court in a filing last month that the state's 2007 law requiring new semi-auto handguns sold in the state to have the capability to permanently mark shell casings, in other words, micro-stamping, uh, says it, it, they're asking for something that cannot be done. NSSF is saying this is impossible. It cannot be done. From a technology standpoint, you're requiring something on guns that's impossible to do. And, of course, I would offer the reason they're doing that is they know it can't be done, so they can keep cutting down and cutting down and cutting down the number of handguns that are authorized to be sold in California. Uh, case in point, says the number of pistols certified for sale uh, has dropped significantly, let's see, from 867 to 504 models. And this filing says it cost the firearms industry $183 million annually since 2013. And that's what California wants. No guns, no guns, no guns. Fred's in Anchorage, Alaska on three. Let's talk uh, slugs and shotguns, Fred. Hey, how's it going, Tom? Yeah, Good. that boy was asking if he could load uh, shells and uh, regular shotgun shells. Right. 
Yeah, well, Lee makes uh, a mold for what they call a keyway slug. What it is, it has a web across the bottom of it. It runs from the bottom all the way to the top. It's just like a little wall inside the center of the slug. Okay. Uh, and it loads right into regular shot shell cups. Oh. And they had, they actually advise in the manual. I'm sitting here with the manual. They advise that you can use them in regular skeet or trap shot shells. No kidding. Yep. That's slick. Uh, you know, all you got to do is buy the mold. And they say any scrap, let it'll do it just about. I know you don't want to be running uh, any zinc or anything into them, so you want to be careful with wheel weights. Right, and stuff, but, but yeah, but yeah. shotgun slugs are typically soft lead anyway. It's not like you're trying to make oh, yeah, them hard yeah, like they're bullets. Just straight, yeah, they're straight lead. Straight lead, just yeah. Take, just take, buy, the, buy, the, buy a bag of lead and melt your own down. So this is the Lee loading manual? Yeah, well, this is the Lee. This is the Lee uh, re- Modern Reloading 2nd Edition. Richard Lee. I know they've got a third edition out now. Perfect. Yeah, All right. and uh, it's actually pretty cheap. You can buy the the, the mold and the handles because with with the mold you got to use the Lee handles more than likely. Right. Uh, but you can buy them for right around fifty bucks. And you're in business. All right. Well, that's good info, Fred. Thank you for that. That's exactly what we're looking for. Let's jump down to uh, Bill. He's in Sparks, Nevada, on four. Say, Bill, we're start talking revolvers here. What are you thinking? Yeah, I'm all for uh, uh, revolvers myself, but I'm, I'm also a, a big fan of a top break if they'd make a decent one, modern mm-hmm. one, you know. Mm-hmm. All the ones, the old ones, I know they're pretty small calibers that I've seen, and I'm, I, I'd like to see something heavier caliber. And I think the modern uh, methods and materials, they ought to be able to build a, a decent top break. I don't know. I don't know if it's a matter of the lockup is not strong enough on a top break, but you're right. I mean, now, they used to have some big bore lock or top break revolvers in the old days, but those were very low pressure rounds. Yeah. But they ought to be able to build one these days. Even if they had to make it, you know, redesign a little bit to have a little more uh, meat on the top and make it run the ramp on out the barrel, you know, with something more lightweight, you know, just to. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the siding plane or something, and, mm-hmm. and uh, keep the weight down somewhat. Make it. They'll be able to build a decent top break. That top up facilitating a fast reload. You know, yeah. together with some of those drop in, you know, five or six uh, That's shots. That's true. You pop it open, it throws them all out. I'm trying to remember. I had a this God. This goes way back. A top break 22 rim fire. Did H and R make a top break 22 rim fire? I don't know. The only thing I've heard. Uh, uh, I don't know anything about that. Hmm. Okay, I, I think it was H and R way back then. I don't know. Well, interesting idea. I will, uh, <laughs> if I get a chance to mention it to one of the uh, gun makers, I'll certainly do that. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate that. And l- as long as we're talking about lead, let's go talk to Randy on two. He's out of California. Let's talk lead, Randy. Hi, Tom. Uh, yeah, I've recently uh, been casting lead bullets. Um, muzzle loaders for a long time, but recently uh, centerfire bullets. Mm-hmm. And I've seen some stuff on YouTube uh, regarding, um, oh, I'm going blank here. Uh, powder coating. The lead bullet. Powder, powder coating, coating, yeah. And I tried a little of it. Uh, seems pretty successful, uh, but I was just wondering if you or any of your listeners might have any information. I, I think one of the main uh, positives on this is not having to lube the bullets with your regular bullet lube hmm. and and using the powder coat in place yeah. of that lubrication. Huh. Well, I, I have to admit, I'm not familiar with that using that on bullets. I mean, yeah, on bicycle frames and a lot of other things, powder coating works great. Um, I guess a couple of things would be maybe a concern. I'd want to know how thick the coating is because it could certainly change the diameter of the bullet. It may not be an issue, but uh, I'd want to know that. Uh, to bind powder coating onto metal, you either have to do it electrostatically or with heat. I think the heat is not an issue. I just looked it up. It looks like maybe something on the order of 300 degrees Fahrenheit will do that. And lead doesn't melt yeah. to melt to get beyond six hundred, so you're sure okay there. I don't know. Yeah. Um, you, you know the, well, now. I, okay, here's the one I, thing. I got a weird brain here. Uh, the one thing it would let you do is do really cool, interesting colors <laughs> for your projectiles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, I, I have seen competitive shooters with colored bullets. I don't know if they're powder coated, but I was just wondering about that. But as far as the sizing, uh, you actually powder coat the bullet before you size it. Oh, so okay. it's so down get, to the correct okay. size. So you, yeah, you size it afterwards. Okay, so you're getting the right sizing yeah. anyway. And believe it or not, that, that paint stays on there. I, I've even dug them out of the, the bank, you know, at the shooting range. Huh. And amazingly, that paint, that paint is almost undamaged. Well, I will freely admit that I did not know that was being done. And I am now fascinated by the idea of powder coating lead bullets. And if you, you know, just the whole idea is kind of a an out there fun thing. So I, I'm going to look it up. I don't know. I can't help you. I'm sorry. But, boy, I'm going to start looking this up because this is brand new info for me. Well, there's a lot on YouTube. And, oh. uh, and they're talking about the lubrication value okay. of it. And I believe it because, like I said, that paint is still on those bullets after you fire them. So. I'll be darned. Well, and, that's very and cool. Barrel, oh, I'm barrel sorry, Randy. like a mirror still. So. Yep. All right. Well, I, I will look it up. Thank you, Randy. I appreciate that. Hey, look, we got to run. Jim's helping me out here. So it's time for the break, too. Uh, 866-TALK-GUN gets you in here. We're open lines. Uh, if there's a gun, ammo, a caliber, a scope, a holster, a sling, a bipod, or anything else that you'd like to share information about or maybe ask me about, give me a holler. I'm Tom Gresham. This is Gun Talk. The battlefield where tyranny is laid to rest, where freedom comes of age, and where legends are conceived. Introducing the FN 509 handgun, a direct result of over 1 million rounds of testing. Descended from over 125 years of the world's most battle-proven firearms on battlefields both foreign and domestic. The FN 509, a legend in the making. Learn more at FNAmerica.com. Perhaps more than any other landscape, wetlands embody the life-giving abundance that nature has to offer. And perhaps more than any other organization, Ducks Unlimited is working to ensure that our continent's wetlands not only survive, but thrive for generations well beyond this one. The time is now to band together. The time is now to rescue our wetlands. Why do hunters and shooters love the Ruger American Rifle? With right-handed and left-handed versions, all-weather, Magnum, Compact, Predator, Ranch, and Scope package options, there's a Ruger American for everyone. Lightweight with an adjustable trigger and minute of angle accuracy, Ruger American Rifles pack in the features. Is the Ruger American the best rifle on the market? See for yourself at your local retailer or at Ruger.com. That's Ruger.com. Every crossbreed holster is handmade based on the design invented by our founder. A Kydex pocket molded around your gun for perfect retention. Leather backing for comfort. Specially designed clips allow you to tuck in your shirt for complete concealment. The highest quality mag carriers and belts sturdy enough to hold any gun. Our holsters come with a lifetime warranty and two-week try-it-free guarantee. Crossbreed. Conceal and carry the cross. Crossbreedholsters.com. Want your next gun purchase to be fast and hassle-free? Well, at galleryofguns.com, you can search through thousands of models from our huge firearms inventory. Find a great offer from a local dealer that includes all fees and taxes. And there's no need to arrange a transfer. Gallery of Guns takes a small deposit on your credit card, and your gun will be at your chosen dealer in as little as 48 hours. Plus, your gun will be covered by our guaranteed lifetime replacement warranty. Galleryofguns.com. Search, find, buy. It really is just that easy. Welcome back, 866 Talk Gun. I'm looking at this, kind of, kind of goes with uh, a lot of things we're talking about. Two different stories I'm looking at right now. One is man survives grizzly bear attack in Montana near Ennis. A man was recovering in the hospital on Tuesday after he was attacked by a grizzly bear while hunting with a friend near the Dry Gulch Cascade Creek area south of Ennis. Two, the two hunters were bugling for elk on Monday morning when they came upon a grizzly bear eating a carcass. Yeah, that's never a good thing. 
says the two men yelled at the bear and it began to charge. The two men attempted to spray the animal with bear spray, but only one man's spray deployed. <laughs> one is none, two is one. That's why you have two. The grizzly bear then attacked Tom Summer, scratching at the man's head and shoulder as he tried to shoot the bear. Goes on, says, uh, he's finally able to spray him, spray the bear from about two feet and escaped. I'm reminded of my friend Jim Reardon. Uh, when I first got to Alaska, 1982, and Jim had been there practically forever. He had trained most of the wildlife managers and game wardens in the state. And I said, all right, Jim, tell me the story. I don't know about bears. I know about cottonmouths and alligators. I'm from Louisiana. So tell me about bears. He said, well, Tom, it's real simple. He says, I don't go anywhere in bear country without a gun. I said, okay, got that. So what's bear country? And Jim says, anything that's not paved. <laughs> he was dead serious, too. I said, well, what about the parks? He says, if they don't let me take a gun in, I don't go in them. This is back when you couldn't carry a gun in the parks. Now you can. Um, so, w- which brings us to the topic of what would you carry? I would say our 357 10 millimeter would be minimum. Uh, 45 ACP, no. 38, no. 9 millimeter, no. Yes, you can do that with, but I want something bigger. What you're looking for is penetration. Penetration. Don't use. Ammo designed for people use either hunting ammo or specifically hard cast lead bullet ammo that gives you some really deep penetration because you got to get through a lot of mass. It could be skull, it could be bone, could be a lot of muscle. Bears are tough. Uh, 44 Magnum, if you could shoot it, sure. 357, absolutely. 10 millimeter, perfect. Um, but have it, know how to use it. Now, contrast that with this other story that we're looking at, and you may have seen this already Cleveland, Ohio. I love this. Remember this number, 60%. 60%, okay? Employees at a Taco Bell, a Cleveland Taco Bell, shot a suspect during an attempted robbery. Uh, Officers responded to the restaurant at 2.45 a.m. When they arrived, they found a suspect with multiple gunshot wounds. We're going to get to the 60% here in a second here. Uh, Let's see. The suspect later died. Yeah, what, that happens. Occupational hazard of being an armed robber. Said the preliminary investigation in, in indicates that three of the five employees at Taco Bell were armed and shot at the two suspects. 60% of the employees who were there at 2 o'clock in the morning were carrying. Guy, these two guys come in armed, wearing masks, and order the employees to the ground at gunpoint. Three of the five, 60% said, uh-uh, don't think so. And so they proceeded to ventilate one of these guys. The other guy, I'm not sure if he got shot or not. Just kind of food for thought on the whole being prepared idea and getting your mind right I'm curious about the the bear thing, and maybe the bear got on them before they could do anything, but I got to tell you, if I'm carrying a rifle, I'm hunting elk, I'm not spraying a bear with spray. If he's coming at me, I'm shooting him. Now, may not have been time, but you know, if there's time to get the spray out and try to spray him, there's probably time to get your rifle out and shoot him. And a rifle is much better than a handgun. When it comes to that, if you've got a rifle that's good enough for elk, it's probably going to be what you need for a bear attack. And yes, there will be paperwork. And yes, there will be reports. And yes, you will have to justify it. And yes, you will not get chewed on by a bear, which would be a really good thing. Because when a grizzly chews on you, you have been well chewed. Just say it, okay? I like, I like the 60% number, though. Three out of five of the employees that had guns pulled them out, shot armed robbers with masks and ordered them all onto the ground. Way to go. 866-TALK-GUN. I'm Tom Gresham. We're open lines. Give me a holler. All 
Sorry, if you're into cast bullets or think about getting into it, Jim, just put me on to this website, castbullets.gunload.com. But bullets is not spelled the way you think. It's B-O-O-L-I-T-S. Now, one word, cast, B-O-O-L-I-T-S, castbullets.gunloads.com. Lots of information there. Let's see, John's with us, line one out of Grants Pass, Oregon. Hey, John, what kind of rifle did you get? Oh, I have a gun safe full of them. Uh, my questions are more general than for a specific rice rifle, but okay. I have two issues I'm interested in your thinking on. Uh, regarding high accuracy, what are your thoughts on barrel break-in? The more you study that, the more it seems like religion than science. And yeah. secondly, what is your opinion on cleaning the barrel? Uh, is there a detriment to accuracy, scrubbing back and forth? Or should you drag something through only in the direction the bullet travels? Aha. All right. We're talking about a bolt-action rifle where we can remove the bolt and clean it from the breech? Yeah, mostly. Okay. Uh, clean it from the breech, take the bolt out, use a bore guide, get it from Brownells. Um, if it is a really accurate rifle, I would recommend when you first shoot it, I would shoot it, clean it, shoot it, clean it, shoot it, clean it for 10 shots. I would clean it after each shot. Yes, it's time-consuming. And I'm talking about cleaning it with a patch and a brush and then a dry patch and, and get it dry, then shoot it. And then for the next 10 shots or maybe 15 shots, I'd like to shoot three rounds and clean it, three rounds, clean it, do that, and then call it happy and declare victory and you're done. Uh, as okay. far as, uh, yes, you run a brush, a brass, not steel, a brass brush both ways, push it all the way through till it goes out the end of the muzzle, and then pull it all the way back till it comes out of the gun. Don't try to reverse the direction inside of the barrel. won't work. Uh, no harm, no foul. Brass uh, brushes are much uh, softer than steel barrels. And so, yeah, I'm a believer in cleaning, good, using good cleaning products. I like the Slip 2000 products, but there are a lot of really good ones out there. Uh, so that's what I would do. If it's, if it's just a regular hunting rifle or most ARs, I wouldn't bother with the whole breaking in thing. I don't think it matters. Okay. Really appreciate your thoughts and your experience. Absolutely. You take care. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah. Stacy's on line two. Stacy, I got about one minute. So go for it, please. Real quick, just clarification that man got attacked by Ennis, Montana, by the Grizzly Bear past week. He could not shoot at it with the rifle because during archery season in Montana, you are not allowed to carry a rifle. You can right. carry a handgun. So, so he was bow hunting? Yes. He, yes. You cannot carry a rifle. When you are bow hunting, bow hunting season has just started. Okay, because I know that there are some places where you can rifle hunt this even this early in the bugling season, but there's nothing in the story I saw that said that they were uh, bow hunting. So I did not have that information. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. If you're bow hunting in some states, you cannot carry a firearm. In some states, you can. Right. Yeah. You can most of the areas here. You can carry a handgun, pepper spray, and your bow, but you cannot carry a bow and a rifle at the same time. Gotcha. Okay. Hey, that's very helpful. I appreciate that. Yeah, the story didn't mention that at all. And I made an assumption, you know what happens when that you do that. <laughs> Once again, I've made that person. And, you know, oh, well, thank you, Stacy. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's good to have all the information. And, oh, yeah, I read it in the general media, so you're not going to get all the information. That's why we have everybody out there to help us out. Uh, lots of folks uh, keep us straight, keep us honest. We appreciate that. All right, we're going to be talking uh, about more guns in just a minute here. Also, let's see, coming up, we're going to be talking, oh, this is cool. You know the whole deal of uh, doctors asking about gun ownership and wanting to put that on your records and it's been a real problem? Well, there's a group that says, okay, we're going to identify doctors that don't do that so you can choose your doctor on the basis of somebody who's not going to intrude into your privacy and ask you about your guns. If that interests you, you absolutely want to stay for this one. It sure interests me. I want to find out what's going on here. If you want to join us, 866-TALK-GUN. This is Gun Talk. Gun Talk. 